cats are magical. We can do anything with cats. Yeah. <laughs> no cats? Really? Okay, anyway, I thought it was fast. All right. So uh, I appreciate everybody coming. We're going to talk about the rare earth situation. And um, some of the speakers today are going to be Ned Mangler, who wrote a book on uh, um, America's resources recently. I'd like to hold the book up for everybody. Yeah, this is the book titled Groundbreaking America's New Quest for Mineral Independence. And I'll be talking about this. If we get the cable, you'll see it on the next screen. All right. And then we're going to have General John Adams, uh, retired General John Adams, talk. John actually wrote a book in 2016 describing the fractures in our industrial base. And in this book and in this book, they both cover the issues of rare earth. Uh, we have an author in the room who wrote a book about this problem and some poor staff trying to fix it. Vicki, uh, Victoria Bruce, and Vicki wrote this book. Uh, that covers this issue pretty extensively. Um, and then we have someone who actually works in the industry. Mark Noga actually works in the industry where you actually try to fit a rare earth magnet onto a motor that goes into a weapon system or into a medical device or into an airplane. And he'll be able to tell you what it's like actually trying to source these materials under the current environment. Uh, and. Um, then uh, John Kutch will be back shortly, and John Kutch will handle a lot of questions about thorium and handling uh, thorium uh, byproduct of rare earths. Um, so I think uh, if we could let uh, General Adams start and, and give you an overview of, of, of why a problem like this needs to be addressed, General Adams. Thank you, Jim. Um, is there anyone who can't hear me? Can you hear me? Is there anybody that says, this guy's voice is not carrying well? Okay, great. Well, it's a, it's a small enough room, so if it's okay, I'm just gonna walk around a little bit. Um, my name's John Adams. Uh, I'm retired uh, Brigadier General, of the United States Army. Retired in 2007, 31 years of service. Uh, when I was on active duty as a senior officer, I was, I would say, exposed to the Army procurement system. Um, both directly in the Pentagon, but also in the field uh, in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, we've still got people uh, exposed to army procurement systems in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, who learn on the job, so to speak. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to join uh, these gentlemen and others who have been, I'll call it the Rare Earth Coalition. Uh, those who care, and there's some of you in the audience who care about rare earths. Uh, because you know how important rare earths are for everything from our smartphones to uh, the ring doorbell that you may have on the, on the front door. Uh, we've got to have rare earths, as you know, for almost everything electronic that we that we use. Uh, whether, in my case, as a, as, a, as, a, as a soldier, or in the case of most of you in the room as civilians, we depend on rare earths for, again, almost everything electronic. Well, I come from the standpoint that the dependence that we have in this case on China for rare earths is a national security threat to our country. Uh, because almost everything that we use is electronic means that almost everything that the military uses is electronic depends on rare earths. Everything from smart bombs, guidance systems for missiles, um, cockpits for, for F-35, the avionics, the things that they use to shoot and move and communicate. In, in any, almost any military platform depends on rare earths for functioning. Um, those of you who may have a medical background uh, or just know how important potassium is for our human bodies, if you don't have a minute amount of potassium in your body, you will not live. It just means that you can't live. If you don't have a minute amount of rare earths in your smartphone, you, it, the smartphone is a rock. So my point is this. It's really important for all of us, whether we're in the military or not. Again, I'm, I'm coming at it from a national security and a military background. But it, every, it's important to everybody. And we're right now, we're dependent on rare earths for, from China to be able to do anything that we do electronic. We all invest our livelihoods and our lives in solving problems of one sort or another. Those of you who are here today in this room have invested 
some time and effort and hopefully you will not be going back to where you came from without an understanding how important it is and how valuable it is to spend some time on the rare earth issue. As Jim said, in 2013, my team at Guardian 6 Consulting wrote this book. Rare earths feature heavily in this. Um, there's two reasons that you might be interested in this book. One, you can see it's heavy, so it could be a good doorstop for you. Uh, but it's, I, hope, I hope that you look it up on Amazon and, and buy the book if you haven't already seen it, because it goes into detail on 14 sectors of the defense industrial base. And in three of those sectors, rare earths are part of it. So again, an important issue, and I think we should be careful to not just say rare earths, that's some mysterious piece of equipment that I don't really understand. Hey, if you think it's new, like if you use a smart <coughs> you understand it. In the book, we recommended actions to make the US less dependent on all foreign nations, nations that our interests are not the same. Obviously, there's a difference between depend being dependent on Canada, kind of like Canada, they kind of like us, so why should we worry about things that are made in Canada. Well, uh, I, I, I guess I don't worry about things made in Canada, but I do worry about things made in, let's, let's choose somebody at the other end of the scale. Let's imagine we were dependent on Iran. Doesn't sound like a good idea, does it? We would not want to be dependent on Iran for really anything. But I would argue that we don't want to be dependent on any country with which our foreign interests are not exactly aligned. And the further away you get from the alignment of our foreign interests, of our interests, from another country like China, like Russia, like you name the country, there's probably something that we've got uh, a difference with them on. We need to be able to have reliable, assured supply of the minerals, of the commodities upon which we depend for our national defense. And we know that being dependent on a country like China, which does not share our, our outlook on the world, is something that threatens our national security. We have, since 2013, seen some improvement in the management of our dependencies on other countries for the commodities and the minerals and the materials that we depend on for our national security, but we've also seen a decline. And one of those places we've seen, I would call it a decline, if only because our lack of action to resolve the dependence on China for rare earths is itself a problem. Because the further this dependence goes on, the more our defense industrial base is undercut. In that time also, China's used this time to strengthen their lock on the global rare earth market. We want to call attention to that. That's what our, our mission is. And that's why uh, I'm, I'm honored to sit with these gentlemen who are looking at the same problem from different angles. We have a, a larger problem to secure access to the key natural resources upon which our 21st century military depends. Um, and this is a big part of this. One thing that we should, that, that's alarming again from a national security perspective is that we've been increasing, we, the United States, have increasingly withdrawn from the mining and extracting sector for the elements that we need for our national defense. We need to have, we need to be as, those who care about our dependencies, we need to be advocating with government and industry uh, for the, about how do we solve our domestic lack of capacity. You know, a simple solution would be, let's get, why don't we just go mine them? Well, it's a comp much more complicated issue. And I, I, I will just tell you that, uh, although we know, and, and many of you may know, that we have enough, we, there's plenty of rare earth deposits in the United States. It's not an issue. That's not the issue. The issue is, how do we process it? how do we create the value chain, and the value chain currently does not exist in the United States. We'll talk with you about a proposal to establish that value chain. And I personally endorse that. The most important part of the risk that we have is that in a national crisis, we can't depend upon foreign sources for our, our national uh, defense. Uh, I'll just give you another example that is, doesn't involve China, but it does involve a country that we all might say is a close ally, or at least not, not, not adverse to our interests. Um, what would you say if I say that we have to be concerned about sourcing some of our national security and defense capability to Switzerland? What's your view of Switzerland? Not, what, I mean, honestly, 
When I think about Switzerland, I think about this really cool country with lots of cool mountains and lakes and uh, yodeling. You know, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's where my head goes when I think about Switzerland. Uh, I don't know about yours. Have you ever been to Switzerland? Has anybody ever been there? Not a threat, right? Well, and 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 I won't get into the, the 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 pros and cons of the Iraq War. That's not my thing today. But we were in conflict. And Switzerland decided that they wouldn't send us their advanced sites for some of our weapon systems because they didn't agree with the Iraq. Again, I'm not going to get into the pros and cons of the Iraq war. What I will say, though, is that when we're in combat, when our troops are downrange and they're getting shot at and we're trying to fight a war, that's not a good time for a country to say, sorry, but we're not going to send you the stuff you need to fight the war. I love Switzerland. Don't get me wrong. I really do. So it's not about the liking or disliking a country. We don't control those things. So the more we control in our own country, the better off we're going to be. Rare earths are not the only minerals and materials that we need to worry about when we talk about our dependence on specialty metals. And we're, we're fortunate to have in this room, and several, I think, others, uh, but Ned Manula, who is an expert on metal and mineral supply and mineral supply chains, We'll go into more detail on this, but we don't, it's not just rare earths, it's so many other materials and minerals that we need to be concerned about. Let's talk about the rare earth monopoly that China has. A little bit uh, as background, and I'll let others go into more detail. 20 years ago, the U.S. was largely self-reliant. We produced rare earth oxides, and we produced the rare earth magnets that are really the, the core of the requirement that we have to have for our defense systems. Rare earths are an essential component of advanced magnets. So 20 years ago, there was no supply chain problem, there's no value chain problem, or it was incipient, we didn't, re didn't realize it yet. But since 2000, China has really cornered the market on rare earth production, along with the high tech components that depend on rare earths. So it's not just the rare earths, it's all the components that go into rare earths that China has sucked in to their country. Uh, a great example, and, and it, not only do we lose the components that are that depend on rare earths, we also lose the intellectual property that allows us to do continued research on the components. Here's an example that I think we can all identify with. Probably everybody in the room either has a smartphone or you've got a friend that's got a smartphone or maybe a cat that's got a smartphone. Um, I, don't, I love cats, I just can't, I can't stop thinking about them. But, how many people in here are cat people? How many people in here are dog people? Both. Both. Yeah, both. How many people in here are people people? <laughs> <laughs> I'll hesitate to stick my hand up on that. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, no, I, I think what we need to think about when we think about the smartphone is realize that it's a, a comparatively recent uh, invention. The iPhone was first made in 2007. Now, Steve Jobs did not want to make that iPhone in China because he, being the smart guy that he is, realized that what would happen is he would take the smartphone manufacturers in China and they would do it, but they'd suck the IP. So he brought the iPhone out 2007, January, by August 2007, Huawei, those of you who are in the room and know about Huawei, Huawei had their knockoff done by August. I mean, they don't waste time. They, bu they built the iPhone knockoff in in less time than it took to build the Pentagon. <laughs> that didn't take long, I think it was a year. But think about that. And now, now if you go to the rest of the world and you say, who's got a smartphone? Most people that are in the rest of the world that have a smartphone, they've got a Huawei knockoff. There's a lot more Huawei knockoffs than there are iPhones. And why is that? Because China's smart. They had the, IP, the opportunity to get the IP because it was in their country. Uh, they have engineers and, and very bright people, just like we do but they wanted to take the IP. And from their perspective, why not? It's easy. It, it's good for China. Not so good for us. Competitively, that hurts us. From a standpoint of losing the IP, and frankly, losing the research and development that comes with the IP, I mean, we stand on IP, not just to make things now, but to make things in the future and develop them. And China has, they are masters of sucking in the IP and then using that to build their R&D chain. And they, they do a very good job of that. 
But China has China does this and has done this for a good 20 years. They, they, it's not a new plan. It wasn't something they woke up in 2007 and with the iPhone and said, yeah, okay, let's get a great idea. We're going to develop uh, an iPhone knockoff. No, this is part of a plan because they they realized 20, 30 years ago that they were behind the West in terms of development, and they, th they said, okay, the tool we're going to use, one of the tools we're going to use is we're going to get their IP and then we're going to make products in China. And that means not only that we're going to make products there, but we're going to know how to develop them and develop the engineering base to develop more. The bottom line on rare earths is China, China today has more than 20% or 20, more than 90% of the global market in rare earths. That's, that's a dangerous statistic because that means that they've got a monopoly. They can, if somebody wants to mine rare earths, China controls the price. They can drive that company out of business, and they've done it before. Who has the other 10%? I'm sorry? What countries have the other 10%? Well, we've got none we've of got it. None. Can there, I answer that? Uh, so Japan is the only other country in the world that has a value chain, and it's not a complete value chain. And I just had uh, an email correspondence with the equivalent of the head of the Department of Energy over there, and he disclosed to me that China, re uh, Japan relies on China for 90% of their base rare earth metals to make the metals, alloys, and magnets. What that means is by the time Japan's done taking care of themselves, there's not an ounce of non-Chinese rare earth metal, alloy, or magnet in the rest of the world. The market is saturated with Chinese material. And the thing is, and Mark can get to this, they essentially ship it around to a few places where they shape it, where they cut it, where they magnetize it, or they just put a sticker on it that says made in Belgium. But the truth is, Pentagon and our tech industry is 100% living off of Chinese metal. So it's a great question. Th thanks for the question. Thanks for the, for the answer. The outright manipulation of the global supply chain is a strategic problem for the United States. It goes along with their hegemonic control over most of advanced manufacturing, most of technology that's made in the world, and also critical weapon component supply chains. It's dangerous for us. One, is the, one of the reasons it's dangerous is because they're not competing on a market-based platform. They're state-owned. So the, the major companies in China, they may say they're private, private in name only, because the people that control the corporations in China are either current or former members of the People's Liberation Army or some other Chinese state-owned uh, cooperative. No other cor nor, 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 no corporation is immune from China's leverage position, regardless of its size, country of origin, or products application. China's actually manipulated the market before. Uh, in 2010, there was a fishing dispute in the, what's called the Senkaku Islands, which is uh, east of, the southeast of Japan. And uh, the, the Chinese call it the Day to Day to Islands. There's a little different name, but it's the same place. China claims it, Japan claims it. Chinese fishermen were in uh, the island, or in the, in the waters around Senkaku Islands, and they had an encounter, uh, a violent encounter with a uh, Japanese Coast Guard. Japanese Coast Guard took the Chinese fishermen and brought them to Japan, and China said, give us, give us our fishermen back. Oh, by the way, we're going to cut off your rear earth supply chain until we get it back. Didn't last long. The fishermen went back home. The supply started flowing again. But what it shows is that China has the willingness to use rear earths as a weapon in economic and military encounters. And that's, a, that's something that should give us all pause. It's also alarming that just last month, we all know that there's a trade discussion going on between China and the United States. But a, an official publication of the Chinese government, one of their press organs, said, America should be careful because we have the rare earths and we might use them in this negotiation process. That should give us pause too. If you threaten something, that means that you might do it. I think you'd agree with that. China's shown a willingness to use this as a weapon in, in, in the conflict with Japan over fishing rights. And they've told us that we should be careful as we do our trade negotiations. Right now, 
we can get rare earths from China at a low enough price that discourages development of our own supply chain. But we know that if we don't address it, that they're going to use it against us. They're going to hold us hostage to their, their, their monopoly. And some people say, I've heard, I've heard some people say in our government, well, as long as we continue to get it at the lower price, then why should we worry? Well, and I'll tell you why should we, we should worry, which is again, they're, they're ready to hold that over our heads in, in a conflict and or in a discussion about trade issues. So what should we do? Uh, I think we can demonstrate that our approach, our U.S. approach to rare earths and rare earths production has been haphazard, unfocused, and minimalist. Basically, we're burying our heads in the sand. The time to look at this problem and come up with a solution that works is right now. Not, not when we're having a conflict. Not when we know that this is a vulnerability that will be exploited against us if we don't address it. <laughs> Most of our mining operations collectively dispose of 85% of global earth demand. They dispose of it. They just throw it away, bury it, get rid of it, get it, because they can't, they can't do anything with it. The heavy rare earth distribution of these easily recoverable resources is roughly three times what is currently coming out of China. So we've got the ability to get rare earths out of the ground. That's not enough because it's a very complicated processing issue. We need a national policy to address our dependence on foreign supply chains for rare earths. We need to have it now. We can't wait 10 years. Our Defense Logistics Agency should, include, should ensure that rare earths that are necessary for key defense products are included in their strategic material stockpile. That could serve as a, a cross-agency stockpile allowing us to acquire strategic materials, in this case, rare earths, at low prices. The 2015 National Defense Authorization Act addresses stockpiling of strategic materials, including some rare earths, but a continuous review is essential given the volatile rare earths market. And finally, rare earths through U.S. industry supported by the federal government should collaborate to recapture a larger portion of the rare earth mining industry. A key component, or key point of that is what this panel is going to discuss a little bit later, which is to form a rare earth cooperative. And I'll let them discuss in more detail. But certainly, we've got the ability to form a domestic rare earth value chain, and we should, we should take steps to, to do that. Um, we've just had meetings on both Capitol Hill and in the White House this past couple of days. There are many people who are looking at this proposal, and I think we've got a very good opportunity right now to move this proposal forward. Again, I'll let the gentleman at the table discuss that in more detail. A rare earth cooperative would act as a fully integrated value chain for the benefit of the United States and our economic allies. It would also be for the benefit of global technology corporations who need a reliable, secure, un uninterruptible source of rare earths for their business. By establishing a rare earth cooperative, we could actually redirect the flow of global capital, and that's important too, for our own economy. I know that you're, as experts, as, as scientists, as businessmen, and as patriots, understand many of the finer details how, of how we could establish a domestic rare earth value chain. Your efforts directly benefit the United States of America, and I, as a citizen, want to encourage you to invest in this problem and help us address it. Thank you very much. So Ned, uh, who has spent his, most of his entire career working with USGS in dealing with these uh, critical material problems, is going to go through some slides for you regarding that. And uh, so Ned, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jim. Ladies and gents, good to be here. I'm Ned Manuel. It's Friday, it's summer, and Congress is out, so put that all together and it tells me that you folks are serious because you're here and you want to listen to some discussion of this very important problem. You know, there is precious little I can add to what General Adams said, and it's really, really a great honor to work with a retired U.S. Army General. So, General Adams, thank you for your kind comments. Uh, I'm going to pick up where John left off, and, but I'm going to come at it from a geological point of view. It's not 
be super technical, but we'll talk about a little more about the geology of this problem. Last year, I, along with my co-author Ann Bridges, the great Ann Bridges wrote the book that you see here, Groundbreaking, America's New Quest for Mineral Independence. We did it because we were so passionate about this issue. You know, our country is in trouble right now, and we're going to work our way out of it because we're Americans. But you know, I wonder sometimes, you now I look out here, a lot of you I, I know, uh, along with me, sat in gasoline lines some time back. It wasn't a pleasant experience, you know, even odd number of days, you can tell your kids, they say, well, what's that? Well, you know, the last number of your license plate, even odd, odd date, even odd, sit in line for 45 minutes, an hour, get up to the pump, find out you were limited to 10 gallons during the life, how are we gonna go on vacation? Just not a good situation. And here we are again, 30 some odd years later with minerals. So, but it, this is different now, it's underreported and people seem to fluff it off. You know, gas is 250, you know, no, no big deal. This is different this time around. At any rate, if you Google groundbreaking or you Google Ned Manuel, you'll find this book. And for those of you here who are supporting your congressmen, senators, especially those from mining states, listen, I, I'm not making any money off of this. This is a mission-driven book. Get this book, read it, brief up your senator or your congressman, okay? Make sure they understand your colleagues. Make sure they understand what's in the book because the book lays out the problem and it's making its way all over the hill because I know other congressmen are buying it, so, and that's good. The next slide, though, I want to draw your attention to, uh, yeah, I did that. This one here. Yeah. Sorry about that. Well, we're having some. There we go. Sorry about that. So maybe across the I think we got it straight up. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm not on. Okay. Uh, the premise of the book are, is really twofold. Number one, America is blessed beyond belief with mineral resources more than any other country in the world. And what's astounding about this is that when we explore for minerals, we find more. So when people say we have X tons of copper left, all you have to do is go explore and find more. Now you have X plus whatever. It keeps growing. We know that already happened with the oil and gas. Remember, we were told get a cardigan sweater, you'll be cold in the dark. Uh, we, oil is out. We're, we have a shortage, and we're running out of oil. Those are all fake news, geological fake news. Okay. This, though, is true. We have abundant mineral resources. The other premise of the book is, believe it or not, we are importing more minerals than any other country in the world. We import from 50 countries. That's about a fourth of the world's countries. We're importing from them here. So those two are the premise of the book, and the book goes on and explains how, how we got into this problem, how we're gonna get out of it. But it is a fact that this is the only country in the industrial world that just tends to shun the mineral resources. In other words, policymakers they don't talk about that. It's, it's almost like an embarrassment. We're so wealthy in that, they don't talk about it. Same thing with oil. You know, they, they just downplay it to our detriment. Meanwhile, China is on a roll. They have made a stated policy of mineral dominance, and they tell you that, and when the Chinese tell you, you've got to listen, because they tell it. And finally, we have to reverse this silliness and do some environmentally sound mining. You know, today you can drill a hole, put hot water in, pump copper out. You don't even have to tear up like Bingham Canyon. You don't have to do that anymore. It's hard to get the message out there. You know, we're used to seeing in the 1960s, 70s, the acid mine drainage commercials on TV. It's got into everybody's brain. It's hard to get it out of there. But worse of all, the worst worse than anything else is the fact we don't have any supply chains for what comes out of the ground. You know, if you dig up coal, you burn it, you make energy, blah, blah, blah. In the case of rare earth, when we mine it, there's no supply chain. So everything we mine has to go back to China. So the next slide shows you this very point. 
as General Adams said, we have plenty of rare earth in this country. There is a map. There are some of the prominent locations. There are others. They're not even all on the map. These have been identified by USGS, my alma mater, where I spent a you know, big chunk of my career. Uh, US Geological Survey. These are confirmed by the Department of Energy, and they've also been reconfirmed by state geological surveys. So there's no shortage of rare earth. There's no shortage of rare earth ore bodies. There's a shortage or an inability to do something with the, with the ore when we pull it out of the ground. I, I, again, I said a minute ago, we have no supply chain to make stuff. Okay. China makes stuff. We can't make stuff. Right? Everything goes to China. I still uh, are chagrin. If you know about the problem, people, a lot of people don't. So it's not to their chagrin. So, but why is this though? In the next slide, I try to get at this. There's, this. there's something to this, and here's my take. This is Ned's take. If you look at the chi, or the philosophy of China, earth, wind, you've heard, you've heard this before. There's even a rock group, earth, wind, and fire, and what was the other one? Soil, whatever. <laughs> In China, they have, the fifth one element is metal. Metal is part of their philosophy. It is deeply rooted in their DNA, their political and philosophical DNA. Okay? Most people don't realize that. And they have a stated goal, founding the table of mineral dominance. Dominance. By 2030, they're going to dominate. And here's another little secret. If they don't have it in China to mine, they'll just send their tentacles out to other parts of the world. And they'll find it. And it'll find its way back to Beijing. So here's what happened. The rare earths, which we used to dominate this way in the <coughs> 1980s, have now become the poster child for critical minerals. You know, you hear more about rare earths in the media than anything, any other mineral by far. It's the poster child. It's an example of why we're getting our well, heads handed to us. Now, again, what you don't see in the media oftentimes is that China's uh, the largest producer. That doesn't mean they have the most. They're just the largest producer. But what you don't understand is they're also the largest importer from other, other parts of the world. Their middle class is exploding, and they need those things, again, to make stuff for their people. And if it keeps going on this way, there doesn't even have to be a threat to use it as a geopolitical instrument, just pure economics. They say, sorry, we need all everything we produce. You get none of it. See you next year. Not a good place to be. So I support the idea of looking at another way to handle this resource. We have it here, but every time we try to do something, we're going to get squashed by economics. So if you look at China, they're the only complete end-to-end mine to market supply chain. And mind market means market means manufacturing again stuff. I keep saying this word. Think when I say stuff, think of iPhones, electronics, flat screens, military hardware. Th that is what I'm talking about. There's an ongoing resource war. Everybody should know about that. No, it's not a. There's a war of resources. It's ongoing, especially over rare earth. And what people don't realize is it started 70 years ago. You know, in 1950, the Chinese were off and running as far as rare earth. They have five major rare earth institutes, each one equivalent to our DOE national labs. And as they're building these institutes, we got rid of our Bureau of Mines in the 80s. We're the only industrial country in the world that has no Bureau of Mines. So that aside, the Chinese are going full bore. So we try to do something and they dash. The Australians try to build a supply chain, it gets dashed, or the Indians or whoever. And China has a black market production that would just be the envy of any other country in the world. And they say, well, we're gonna put a cap on these illegals. You know, we're gonna cap them down. But really, they're in control of it. It's a gas pedal. It's a gas pedal. So, bottom line, we have a market failure, 
Okay, some economists don't like that term, and I don't care if they like it or not. Use another term. It's just just a semantics. The free market doesn't work because we have governments who support mining companies in other countries. It doesn't happen that way here. Okay? So we have to have an American solution. And after looking at this for four or five years, I think the best thing is a co-op. You know, you go into Florida, each citrus grower doesn't make their own orange juice. It's a, and it goes into a co-op. You ever hear of uh, Sunkiss? That's a co-op. True Value Hardware, that's a co-op. Ace Hardware, that's a co-op. You guys both probably belong to Federal uh, uh, Pentagon Federal Savings and Loan. That's a co-op. All the credit unions are co-ops. There's co-ops, co-ops everywhere. They're very successful, and they each want to attack a little market failure. They go around and they band together and they do this. So there's nothing wrong with it, and it looks like it might be the perfect solution for rare earth as a pilot program because if it works here, it could work for other min minerals. And I'll tell you with my concluding slide right here. Uh, rare Earth is not the only Chinese monopoly. It's not even close. They have their designs on other minerals, metals, commodities that they monopolize. The most recent example was last month where the Chinese bought one division of Cabot Corporation, a U.S. company, they bought the specialty fluid drilling division of Cabot. And in so doing, they now control the market of cesium, or more accurately, cesium fomate, which is a material used to inject into boreholes for high pressure wells like in the Gulf of Mexico. It is so exotic. You can't buy it, you have to rent it. So, you know, a tanker pulls up and you rent that, and when you're done with that well, you give it, return it. They tie, they, they tied that up for a stake at $130 million. They tied that up, and we're beholden to China and India and a few other countries, that, frankly, we shouldn't be doing business with. For Bayrite, any Texans here, oil people here? Bayrite is the principal component for drilling money. So just when everybody says, oh, America's en we're energy independent, we don't have anything to worry about. And I opened my segment with this. <coughs> yes, we do have to worry all of a sudden, because they're backdooring our energy independence by going after minerals that we require to stay energy independent. What's next now? And I'm saying, how many, more, how many times does this have to happen? By the way, there was no CFIUS involvement or approval of some of these deals. What the is doing. Yeah, question. Yeah, question. Yeah, kind of. There's a certain mine, mountain pass in California, that keeps bubbling and rising to the surface as like the solution to this problem. Can you talk a little bit about that? Whether that's feasible? And no, it's not a solution at all. It's, uh, in fact, that didn't have a CFIUS review either, and it was bought by a company that's controlled by Chinese uh, investors. I don't understand, but here's the point you can mine all of the rare earth in this country you want. Every gram of it has to go where? China. So I don't care, Mountain Pass, Mountain Pass. Okay, we have all these rare earth deposits. We're blessed, but it has to go there. We have no value chain. And it's a great question, but it really bothers me. So I'm done with rare earths now. Just imagine when the co-op is successful, could it be applied to other minerals? Go ahead, you had a question. And I'll come back. I'm almost done here. One more minute. I'm always looking for questions that uh, get people to think. Give me that much. How much would it? How much would it cost for an investor to invest in a company to make this chain work? To make to, to get this chain started. Okay. Hundred well, million. Well, listen. Let me, let me start. You know, this, this is a perfect, perfect question, and I really want to give it to the perfect person to answer that question. Okay. Would you mind if I hold off? This sure, man could sure. tell you sure. way more. He forgot more than I know on that topic. But to finish Ned's part of this, that blue tornado-looking thing, Jim, if you go back to the I mic. Can't get it. That's right. Don't worry about it. We are beholden to China for about 17 different minerals, critical minerals, at 100% import reliance, and another 17 between 50 and 99%. And some of those, like arsenic, 
antimony, which is used to make munitions, cesium, bayrite, we're in trouble, folks. 34 minerals, almost between 50 and 100 percent import reliant. And if you looked in the right hand column, that had the, the countries in red, it was China and Russia, China, Russia, China, Russia, China, Russia. So, bottom line for 34 minerals that we're importing, the critical ones, two thirds to three quarters of our critical mineral imports to the United States are controlled by at least competitors, possibly adversaries. That is a horrible way to start the day. But that's the reality of today's U.S. So we wrote the book because we were stunned and we're trying to educate folks on how we got in and how we eventually, God willing, will get out of that problem. Yes? In these talks that General Adams mentioned about in the White House, what, what is the feeling about this in the White House as far as dealing with trade issues? Okay, excellent. And can I take a minute to answer? Yeah. And you'll fill in my gaps, which there will be. You see China trade and you read China trade you're just starting to see now mention of minerals and the term rare earth. When you see the term rare earth, it means rare earth, but think in your mind the canary in the coal mine or the poster child for the other 35 minerals that I just showed you that, you know, you get. Okay, so it's just starting to become the thing, and then the other day, what did we see? We saw G, uh, G, where did he go? He went to southern China to a rare earth manufacturing place. Why did he do that? There's, he's signaling, saying, in fact, uh, Deng, Deng Xiaoping, sorry, three decades ago warned us. He got up and warned us. See, we don't listen. Deng Xiaoping said, the Middle East has oil. China has her earth. <coughs> no one listened. They were telling the truth. That was in 1992 he gave a speech. And he was telling the Western world, don't fool with us because of this situation. And here we are 30 years later, boom, we're smack into it. I'm going to now ask for any remaining questions, and then I'm going to introduce our next speaker. If there are any other questions? Sir. So Mountain Pass is in my district. In my okay. Uh, so... You, you playing it off, but is there anybody in the U.S. that's closer to making concentrate or metal or anything else like that? Uh, uh, when you say closer to making concentrate, out of the uh, on the steps, uh, so they're uh, light rare earth. But right. yeah, you know, I, I mean, go ahead, take that, Jim, and I and uh, yeah. I'll introduce you. Okay. So listen, uh, Mountain Pass, uh, as you said, they Absolutely. can only make the light half of the rare earths. And uh, right now, they're shipping most of the inventory. They're shipping it all. I, I was there That's two all weeks they're ago. doing. Correct. And so then they're going to sell concentrates, which is essentially, you know, dirt. They're going to start selling, shipping dirt to China. And um, there's another owner of the refining assets, and they're not getting along. And when they do get along, and they put those two back together again, they'll make oxides. And I'm going to tell you right now, oxides have no meaningful technology or defense application. And so those oxides will also be shipped to China. So if everything goes right for them, all they're gonna do is feed the dragon. We gotta quit feeding the dragon, okay? So we've been working on Defense Production Act money mm -hmm. to get them, so I don't know if you know, I'm sure you do, uh, Molly Core put a ton of money in that <coughs> to try to get it past the levels. And I'm, I'm not the expert to remember which is so you got concentrate, you got, I guess, oxide, and you got metal, and then you got magnet, right? Right. Or something at that mm -hmm. route. So, uh, so look, I was I was very involved in this. Mm -hmm. While while Molly Corp was raising money and doing their IPO, I was involved in this, and I was advising the Pentagon, and I was talking to Molly Corp, and I was talking to Neo Materials, which is essentially a front corporation in China. And I was made aware of the transaction where Molly Corp would buy Neo Materials, which is a front company for China, right. and essentially become part of that. And I exposed that to the Pentagon in 2009. They didn't listen. They never had a plan to make metals in the United States. They were going to feed Neo Materials 
which was formerly MagnaQuench, a company in Indiana. Right. It was the sole domestic producer of rare earth magnets for our guided weapon systems. So, um, Molly Corp told, told a great story. And the story was, uh, um, <laughs> their entire business plan consisted of three letters, IPO. They got their IPO, and then they let the shareholders deal with the mess. And I don't think things are going to improve in my slides. I'll be able to tell you, and I think you should know this. Any rare earth company that opens up outside of China and produces light rare earths can be easily bankrupt by lowering the, the price on just two elements, neodymium and praseodymium. It's the only place they make money. Right. They actually lose money on 80% of their mineral production. So if you keep looking to companies like that to solve your problem, we're never gonna get out of the dog house and we've got a solution for this and I wanna get into that for all of you guys so that we can see the way to go. Okay, and any questions uh, remaining on my segment no, and really any questions on groundbreaking? Okay, get the book, brief up your senators and congressmen, and uh, yes, sir. Uh, may I answer a question? Quickly. So, uh, for the resources you have mentioned, they're all very similar, measurable, similar engineering, similar indicators. So for the ending of those financials, it's like all of them are like inferred or are they are like that is a super technical question. Can we do that afterwards? Yeah, I'll, that I'll, is not, I'll take care of no that. No one That's in this room is going to understand the answer to that well, question, but we will give it yeah, to you. Yeah, resources versus reserves. That, that's uh, super I'll technical. Okay, folks, I want to, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. James Kennedy. He is the founder and president of, of three resources, and he is probably, I want to say, one of the, if not the, foremost expert on rare earths anywhere in the world today. And Jim has studied this issue for many years. He's been personally involved. And I love some of the concepts he's come up with. They make sense to me as a geologist, as a military man, and as you'll see our other panel. So Jim, why don't you take it? It's great to be here with you. Thank you, everybody. Look, I know uh, that uh, I hope lunch was okay. I want you to sit a little while. Don't, don't leave on me, at least not right away. I'm gonna fly through a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things you need to understand. And one of them is that this isn't a new problem. The GAO actually determined, and it's in writing, it's in GAO reports, that rare earths are a bedrock national security issue. And they also put in writing that, that China can use rare earths to interrupt our procurement up, uh, in, for weapon systems. Well, that's a national security issue screaming at you, right? Literally, it's been over a decade. There have been probably two dozen bills offered, and no one's come close to solving this problem. And I'm going to tell you why. They all think it's a mining issue. So out of every single bill that's been offered, uh, with the exception of the Rubio bill today, they all talk about mining. And they're going to get those resources to you by lowering environmental standards, lowering you know, human safety protections, uh, getting more access to federal lands, which I'm not opposed to. But so, like Ned said, you open 10 new rare earth mines, you have 10 guys that are going to produce concentrates or oxides, and they're going to ship to China. Um, so why haven't we solved this problem? The problem has been alluded to by both of the other panelists, and that is because this is not a market problem. This is market failure. And so, if you approach this problem trying to solve it with traditional market mechanisms, you're going to fail, and you're going to fail because China worked into their monopoly a surety that they can challenge any uh, market-based approach to solving the problem. So this is, <laughs> I hope you can appreciate this, the, four la uh, the last four premier leaders in China, by the way, anyone who drops their card off right here, I will send you this file and it's got links that you're going to want to see. The last four premier leaders in China were directly involved in making serious commitments to, to building this industry, and two of them had massive financial commitments. Deng Xiaoping's family ended up actually owning and controlling MagnaQuench. That was a $70 million asset back in the 90s. That's mind-blowing, okay? 
the current man who is running the show that we're negotiating with, his family, according to Forbes, had over had nearly four hundred million dollars in rare earth refining and processing assets as early as 2012. What if the last two presidents of the United States were in the oil business? Okay, I mean we got close a couple times. How weird would it get? Okay, you have to understand this is this is a government operating at an interest level on these minute collection of resources and they're making a tremendous difference. So they have a hyper mercantile strategy, they use leverage, they use control of these uh, acts, these resources, and I'm gonna tell you how awesome this power is. So you, you heard the, the story about Steve Jobs. You heard that he had no place to go. You heard that a little company that could never cause us any trouble in the future called Huawei knocked off those phones in less than a year. Now, that same company that was leapfrogging on technology they could acquire this way, is now considered by our government a national security threat for other technologies they've leapfrogged. That's the same for starter motors, for automobiles, that's the same for catalyst or uh, uh, green technologies. You know, what happened to Siemens? They were gonna build all the world's wind turbines. Well, they didn't have any neodymium or praseodymium metal, so all of the guts of those systems got built in China, and then some other things, and then some other things, and then the next thing you know, China's in that business, and they're in the advanced solar business, and they are building all the battery packs, uh, the advanced battery packs for electric vehicles. And when does it end? They have this China 2025 plan. And <laughs> I don't know how naive you wanna be, but when I look at that, I see absolute global domination of every single industry that produces high margins and a good standard of living for human beings. And we're gonna be out of all of them. So we have to do something. So, what has been the consequence of this? The commercial consequence of this is they have aggregated the world's IP. Every company in the world that takes a product to the point where they wanna roll it out commercially, well that means they have to build a billion dollar factory. That need, means they need to go to a investment bankers can build that factory and the investment bankers will never give them the money until they can prove that there will be no critical materials shortages. So when they go to solve that problem, they end up in China and China says to them, build them here or no guarantee. Oh, and by the way, here's some nice land. Here's a hookup to the grid. And look, we got all these workers and don't look over there because we're building your factory already while we're talking. <laughs> This is the, the, the consequence on the commercial side. On the military side, it's actually frightening. They control 100% of the advanced materials, critical materials that go into our weapon systems, and they're doing this, they're cultivating a dependency relationship with all Western defense contractors. We have met with the defense contractors. They're scared. They actually know that China can control their ability to deliver products. And you know what, they're not so worried about the war. Because when the war th starts, they know Uncle Sam will just throw on the cap and they'll get whatever they want. You know what they're worried about? Peacetime stability of resources so their stock price doesn't make a hit. And I hate to say it like that, but it's true. The meetings we had were extremely frustrating. Okay, you guys have to understand what General Adams was alluding to. There's a guy named Michael Pillsbury. Don't worry, no big deal. Wrote the best book on this you'll ever see. I recommend it to everyone here. You have to understand that, that China has a philosophy and this philosophy is super aggressive. There was a report in 1999, it was called the Cox Report. I pulled this from the Cox Report. I presented this once and people said, no way, you just made that up. No, this is the four highest ranking people in China and they're essentially restating the policy of Deng Xiaoping, which says that everything about our economic <clears throat> endeavors is about our military endeavors. And so they call it 16 characters. And this is four guys saying the same thing four different ways. It's the Rubik's Cube of how they're going to kick our ass, okay? 
Just look at this. Let the civil support the military. I'm not making this up. This is in a Cox report from your Congress. Okay? Um, so it is observable that, that they have, a, in addition to their stated policies, they delivered everywhere. These guys are leading the world in basic science, IP, R&D, and this is really something you guys need to follow up on. These guys have developed or long stage development of next generation weapon systems, and in some places we're not even in the game. Okay, I'm gonna make this statement. I believe this. I believe that their program of global economic domination that's largely leveraged off of this tiny group of metals is much more ambitious and far-sighted than the U.S. Manhattan Project. They have two cities. Two cities, they call rare earth cities, like Gary, Indiana, was a steel town. And that's what they were. They were built to do this and nothing else. 17 million people, a large number of working directly in it, just like in the Manhattan Project, that had a peak population of about 130,000 people, and cities, secret cities that our government built. Somebody was doing the laundry there, just like somebody's doing the laundry here. So just look at it. The commitment is 15 times larger. This is something Ned alluded to. They literally have four national labs that only do rare earths. At the establishment of the Bauto Lab in 1985, they announced to the world that it was the largest dedicated rare earth facility in the world, and it still is. Now, where were we? Part-time, part-time in it. Ames Labs, for almost this entire period above, was doing nothing. Then, recently, we panicked and we gave them $135 million to look for substitutes the invisible elements that we haven't found yet on the periodic table, right? Or let's define substitute, second best or third best or sort of close. That's the definition of a substitute. Are we gonna win, you know, running around trying to compete with China with substitutes? This one should actually cause you guys a little bit of trouble sleeping tonight. It did for me when I, when I commissioned this work. This is, Every single patent filed in the world from the very first rare earth patent every fi ever filed by the United States in 1950. And this is us. So what you can see here is a really bad set of trend lines. Theirs are going up. Ours are falling. Ours are, we're drowning. We're underwater. We're not competing anymore. And the problem is when you're running IP and you're controlling IP, you're on the verge of the next idea by definition. You've basically given this up. So sometime, by sometime in uh, uh, 2021, China will have more rare earth patents than the rest of the world combined. Okay, who's asleep? Because I'm gonna tell you why that matters. It's gonna matter because their strategy is so clever. They'll have so many patents, but they'll have ring fans every Western patent that exists. And when somebody in Hitachi or Boeing or Siemens wants to update their patent and keep it current, guess what? There's no room. They're ring fenced. They're going to nullify every Western patent that exists in a very short order, and we're so asleep on this. This is so important for us to realize. These guys, uh, uh, Pillsbury said it best, the 100-year marathon. These guys are running flat out for 100 years while we're napping. We've got to actually tackle this thing. So, and this is, <laughs> you're all gonna really wake up one day and go, what the hell happened? Huh. China will one day be the most in, in hardcore enforcer of IP in the future. Once they ring fenced us and they got all the IP, who do you think is gonna go around with the WTO and start slapping people around? They are. These guys are gonna use the laws we built to protect us, to protect us from them. They're going to turn the whole thing around on us. We have to do something. Okay, um, these are all active links, so when you give me your card, I'll send you this and you can see these links. China literally has already launched active satellite systems and quantum computing. I'll tell you why that matters. Because if you want to control weapon systems or drones, 
uh, or have information that's literally unhackable, quantum can guarantee it. You guys understand, that's two subatomic particles that can talk to each other, right? And you build a communication system on it, somebody tries to intercept it, they can't intercept it. This is probably the most important thing that's gonna change the world. China already has deployed a uh, rail gun and they've actually accidentally leaked pictures of it to us. They have other kinetic weapons that they're working on. Hypersonic weapons, China has the largest hypersonic testing facility in the world. Space Force, Chinese have already used and deployed Space Force. We're talking about our Space Force, right? These guys have already done work there. Of course we have too, but they're there. And this is one we're gonna talk about later in the second briefing. They are talking about nuclear powered weapons systems. It's in their newspaper in English, begging us to read it, but guess what? We don't read it. Um, all of these systems, every one of them, requires super, super highly refined, high purity, rare earth metals, or post oxides, and guess what? We can't even produce them. We can't produce them. We want to do uh, 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 directed energy weapon. Well, how are we going to build them and deploy them in the field when China essentially controls our ability to do that? <clears throat> Here is my last slide on this issue, and I know I'm really abusing your time. <clears throat> I want you, we started this talking about their 100-year marathon, their commitment to this. There is a new ultra-naturalistic military economic strategies. This uh, 2007 law requires every single Chinese citizen and corporation and non-for-profit to act as a national intelligence asset. That means the nice Chinese kid who's related to somebody back home is in powerful, that we put in a defense contractor, uh, uh, or a national lab, or is it a MIT, those guys are absolutely legally bound to spy for China. Um, a good friend of mine's Chinese, his father was a general under Mao. He's very, very well connected. He's a US citizen. He's really committed to us, but we have incredible conversations. And he says to me, Jim, you guys have it all wrong in the United States. You pay your spies all this money to go out and do everything. We just tell everybody they're our spy and they do it better. And it's true. So in this one, I don't know how many of you people actually know some folks that are Taiwanese. But I've, talk, I, I've had conversations with people from tai, Taiwan and they've told me that China has <coughs> communicated to them that they are Chinese citizens because they have, they have their Chinese descent. And these people are saying to me, Jim, they really believe that, and, and that follows us, even if I become an American citizen. As far as they're concerned, I have an obligation back to China. Now, they're gonna be great citizens, because they are, but that's how arrogant the system is, okay? Uh, guys, I can't abuse you too much. Uh, the way this thing is structured is designed to collapse anybody who challenges it, and their official stated capacity not what they produce, their official state capacity is two times what they currently make. And their official internal estimates of black market is 150% of their actual production, which means these guys are closing, uh, uh, capable of churning out three times what the world needs. Now, if you're a businessman and you're honest and you're smart, you know what this says? They're saying, stay out of our sandbox. You come in our sandbox. You're not getting sand in the eye, you're gonna eat sand. This is a clear message not to come into their sandbox, and their sandbox is rare earths. So, they produce 80% of the resource, they process close to 90% of the world's oxides, and they produce well over 95% of the metals, leaving China and Japan, and Japan is almost 90% dependent on them. That means nobody, and I mean nobody other than Japan is getting uh, non-Chinese metal. We're all getting it. It doesn't matter if it comes from Belgium, Belgrade, it doesn't matter. That's the truth. You've got to, you've got to accept it. Um, 
I'm gonna just be nice to you guys. Sweet. Okay, so now we have a speaker here who actually works in the industry. Mark Miller is gonna come up and let you guys know what it's actually like trying to fit rare earth magnets into a system for a defense application or a medical application or a prototype weapon. And he's gonna tell you the new compounded difficulty that now he can't use uh, unsourced materials and so the job is technically probably impossible. There's always ways around it, but I want everybody to please uh, please uh, respect Mark's time up here and he's gonna give you some light on this, Mark. I've got your two slides right here. Jim, thank you. Well, you're not gonna <laughs> I worked in the exclusively in the electric motor business for 26 years after leaving the University of Michigan in 1993. Could you use the microphone? Jim. Yeah, oh yeah, you use the microphone. Sorry. That's better. <laughs> My name's Mark Noga. I've been in the motor industry from 1993 till present. <clears throat> University of Michigan is where I went to school started working at Deacon Technologies, went from there to United Technologies, and then hopped through a variety of other businesses. Um, the electric motor industry is in pretty small niche. Um, however, it's a $22.5 billion business, at least the segment that we refer to is the DC motor business. This doesn't include AC motors, it doesn't include uh, anything except for long field and permanent magnet DC motors. So looking forward, permanent magnets will be the lion's share of DC motors. Long field is kind of old technology. Uh, of that 22 and a half billion uh, chunk of worldwide sales, it's Asia Pacific, US, and Europe that dominate. And it's growing at about six and a half, or 6.2, 6.1%. Compound annual growth rate. Um, <clears throat> magnets in these motors are where we find the rare earth materials, right? It used to be back in the 90s and the 80s, ceramic magnets, ferrite magnets, they were the norm. And in fact, you still see them quite a bit. If it's an analog brake motor in your car, power seats, window lift motors, things of that nature, now those are going to be super cheap ceramic magnet stuff, and they're great. However, those magnets are probably four mega gauss Worsted energy products. Meanwhile, samarium cobalt magnets are 32 mega gauss Worsteds. Neodymium is 48 to 52 mega gauss Worsteds. So we're talking, those, those, those units don't mean anything to you, but you're talking eight to 10 plus times the energy product out of these rare earth magnets as opposed to these ferrite magnets. And what happens with that is we can make our motors much smaller, much more power dense, much lighter, and that becomes super attractive in newer applications. Um, you might not find an automotive manufacturer willing to spend that, that kind of premium for high power dense, small light. Uh, motorized components, but you certainly will find aerospace and defense customers wanting to pay this kind of money. And as motor designers and motor manufacturers, we don't particularly care where we get this material, how it's happening, all the things that Jim and everyone else here is talking about. We just care that we can, we can acquire it. And over time, there's been regulations, there have been, there's been laws whether it be an ITAR regulation or whatever that have been in place that have made us have to work around those laws to get these materials on hand. But we don't really care where they're coming from. Some of the stuff that Jim's talking about, it doesn't really matter to us. Just give me my neodymium magnets, give me my samarium magnets, so let me provide a super high power dense solution for my customer and how that happens, who cares. Um, <clears throat> Let's see here. Can you need the next one? No. I, I want to say quickly, <laughs> as far as applications go, <clears throat> I've already mentioned just in conversation, window lift motors, analog brake motors, power seat motors. If we look 
and, and those are the ones that don't use rare earths necessarily. If we look at what we're doing right now in our business, almost every single motor that we propose to our customers looking forward uses rare earth magnets. There, there's, there's not a, if, if it goes on an airplane, if it goes in a military robot, if it goes in a defense system, it's going to use either neo or samarium magnets. So rare earths might not mean a lot to people here, or perhaps it means a ton to you because that's, that's your world and you love it. To me, all it means is how strong is the magnet? <clears throat> and I don't use ferrite magnets anymore. Every one of my customers wants something, unless it's an automotive customer. They want something that uses rare earth magnets. So I can't even list them all. But personally, this year alone, I would have done ERGM LRS, Argum, Hellfire, uh, Taurus Missile, Joint Strike Fighter, Motors for guiding missile for, for the missile fin actuation. Um, that's GMLRS, Argon, and Hellfire, Taurus, fuel pump actuator, joint strike fighter, weapons eject systems, where a motor drives a canister that fills up uh, to a certain PSI and it blasts the missile off of the off of the, uh, the aircraft as opposed to pyrotechnic settings to do it. So they're they're everywhere for us. So what, where, where does it leave us right now? The situation, well, previously there were workarounds. Um, it's called waivers, you guys, no waivers. <laughs> Sorry. Now, to me, in my world, <clears throat> again, I, I don't mean to, to, be, to sound ambivalent, but we don't care how we got our magnets, as long as they were legal, right? The biggest issue we, we've had over the years is getting material that was ITAR compliant. The way to get ITAR compliant material is we would give our magnet vendors a drawing, then the magnet vendor would sanitize that drawing, they would send that drawing to China, and China would provide, let's say the magnet was, you know, looked like this. They would create a drawing that looked like this, and the magnet would come in like this, and then get to the United States, and we'd cut it off, and that, that would look like that, right? That, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but we would, we would make sure what we gave, in terms of technical data, stayed in the United States. Our United States supplier would then sanitize that, send it to China. China sends something back, and our supplier then puts a final grind on it, magnetizes it, puts a coating on it, something of that nature. So the IP hasn't gone to China, we've complied with the ITAR and off we go. Well, now with House Resolution 5515 that went into place in August of 2018, I think, it's all kind of blown up. And it, the supply base here is pretty discombobulated about it. They're not really sure uh, how to comply we're not sure how to comply. Our competition, their legal teams comply in a manner that may hurt them, it may hurt us, we're not really sure. But the bottom line is, for us, our prices have gone up seven to 15 times on any Samarium, and especially Neo, because Neo, I do believe there's only one person right now that's claiming they can provide McCain Act compliant engineering material. So we don't really know if it's compliant. We get certificates of conformance from our, our magnet suppliers that say that it's compliant. So that's our defense. But without either a waiver from the Secretary of Defense or the Canex compliant rare earth magnets, we are dead in the water. And those rare earth magnets that are mechanic compliant are seven to 15 times more expensive and it takes us longer to get them. So that's, that's the rambling nutshell of how this is impacting us right now in the industry. I don't wanna go any longer than that because 
know I have more to say. However, if there's any questions specifically on this, I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Um, maybe not just for not, maybe not just for Magnus, but is there a, a market? Could there be a market for recycled materials or such? Okay, I have an opinion on this, but Jim would probably be a better better person to answer. I, I don't think that that's a legit way for us in my business to use magnets. Okay, I think the infrastructure to actually recycle those materials, to pulverize the magnets, reclaim them, reconstitute them, and use them, there's just not enough money in it, I don't think. That's just my Yes, that's a good question, and I'll tell you this, John and I, John Kutch and I, have talked to some folks that are trying to do that, and, you, and they're serious, they really want to do it. Their problem is that they can't get virgin, high-quality material from China to blend those magnets back up to spec. They can't make spec magnets. So even the recycling, you can't get to where you need to be without China essentially giving you the magic dust. And, you know, it, it, it's so wonderful that Mark could come here because a lot of folks aren't willing to actually say where the problems are because a lot of folks are the guys that are getting waivers that they know or they know the sourcing's not good. But where he's at in the industry, he feels like he can tell you he thinks it's important to get this problem fixed. So he wants to be honest with you. And I, and I really want to thank him for that. that, that is, it's, it's, it's something you need to know and you need to know from industry. So, look, I'll just skip a lot of this, but I'm going to tell you this. China has built in offensive and defensive mechanisms into their monopoly that can attack anybody trying to come into the space at many levels. Like I said, all they have to do is lower the price of neodymium and praseodymium, and every single light rare earth company in the world outside of China will go bankrupt. No denying this. All you have to do is look at their balance sheet. By the way, since 2010, 400 junior rare earth mining companies have gone bankrupt. So, look, we're, I'm going to skip. Just, we're just going to burn through all this. This is going to be available for you. By the way, this is exactly what comes out of Mount Pass. It has none of these. And when you get these, you get this little booger right here, okay? Thorium. And I'm going to tell you a little secret about the rare earth supply chain. Historically, every single bit of rare earths in the world were a byproduct of some other commodity that was mined. And it all had this. And then when Mountain Pass opened up, they were only their only business was selling lanthanum to the petroleum industry. And they weren't even in this business. They weren't a player. Now when they spun their IP or their IPO, they made everybody think. They were these guys. They were never these guys. So what happens? These guys, when, when Mo, um, Mo, uh, Molly Corp comes into business, these guys still are in business, and they're supplying 100% of the world's heavy rare earths. And then something happens. In 1980, the NRC and the IAEA got together, and they wanted to solve what they considered to be proliferation issues. They wanted to control the movement of uranium or plutonium. So they went out and they got a uranium mining law and they said, let's apply this uranium mining law to every mine in the world. And when they did that, nobody could see it at the time because this is 1980. And the neodymium iron boron magnet hadn't even been invented yet. No one could see it. But in 1980, they created a law that through the regulations designed for uranium mining put every single one of these byproduct producers out of business. They couldn't keep mining titanium and selling monazite because when they took their, their titanium out, their monazite was legally a concentrated material and monazite contains thorium. So what happens? They said, this is a liability, and if we, if we do anything with this, we're going to go out of business. So you know what they did? Open up the ground they just mined, put it back in, get a truck, dump some dirt on it. That's what they do. They spend money burying this stuff and getting it back below background radiation. 
And this is true for the guys that produce phosphates for fertilizer and iron ore mines. As General Adams said, if you took all of the recoverable heavy rare earths that have been pushed out of the supply chain because of this regulatory thing and that little element there, you could meet 85% of the world's rare earth demand. Literally, we could put China out of business. And what's the mining cost on this? Zero. So, when I went to the Pentagon in 2009, I wanted to propose a solution to solve it. And the solution starts with this. The solution starts with uninterruptible flow of resources. Because if you're gonna build a $5 billion metallurgical facility to make metals, alloys, magnets, garnets, and other post-oxide materials, and somebody can shut you down, you got a $5 billion lemon, and nobody wants that much lemonade. So, job number one, uninterruptible. Job two, how do we get enough money to build a facility that can challenge Go around all day and not find it. As I said, two cities. Two cities, 17 million people working on this. China actually internally consumes 75% of all the world's finished rare earth products. So that means that we got every single country in the world and every corporation that needed rare earths, and we got them all to work with us to tomorrow. They'd have three quarters, and we'd have to compete with them. 25%. So we have to beat them with one third of scale, and that's the best yet game we've got. How do we do that? Well, we solve it like we've solved every single market failure in this country for the last 230 years. That's by creating a cooperative, like an old farmer co op. The first farmer, farmer co op was created by Congress. Congress creates and authorizes every co-op that operates and continues to operate in the United States, including your, your uh, credit union, your rural electric. Congress is the only body that can give an a, 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 a antitrust exemption. And by definition, if you have a legal cooperative, anybody who needs these materials can invest, even if they're competitors. So now you solve an antitrust problem now you're potentially creating the solution, and this is what the solution looks like. We've got all these resources that are being thrown away, and maybe we want to make some rare earths from coal, and we want to do some recycling, and Mountain Pass wants to keep mining their old-fashioned way, that's fine. But we need an uninterruptible flow, which means when we've got a thorium problem we have to deal with. So we offer a multinational platform inviting every single one of our economic allies and our NATO, NATO allies to fund this thing. And because it's a cooperative, they own it, they manage it, they run it. There's no government involvement. There's no subsidies. These guys own the off-tank in proportion to their investment. That means if Toshiba put in 10% of the money, Toshiba gets 10% of the output. Anything left over, get sold at market prices to the rest of the world. And then you're complying with WTO standards. This thing was vetted by the Justice Department. There's no conflict anywhere for this to happen. So who are the guys that put in the money? The great big te tech companies that are pregnant with IP that they can't exploit. Because they saw what happened here. They saw what happened with Jeep. They saw what happened with Siemens. Do they really want to get in bed with China again and give them their technology? No. They're literally pregnant with, with, with new IP. And the only way they can exploit it is if we can create for them an environment where it's safe. Think about this. The United States and the world, the only other guaranteed source of uninterruptible, low-cost, high-tech metals. We get them to come here with their next stage of IP where it's safe. We create the haven, we get their manufacturing. We get them to come here and revitalize our cities. This is a very powerful thing. And we've talked to people at JogMec, we've talked to people at Coors. I've had extensive relationships with the, the heads, the last two heads of the European Union's Rare Earth Commission. They need a solution, we can provide the solution. 
and the solution will put the United States back on the center of the board again. And if we're back on the center of the board again, and people are doing things in here, and customers out here are doing great with their new products, and they want to do new products, maybe we'll start ramping up that IP again. This is the only way back into the game. Now, everybody should be going, oh, but Jim, what do you do with that thorium? Well, thorium comes out of the rare earths, and then another privately funded and operated entity that is very interested in developing thorium takes over the responsibility. Every time I sell a kilo of neodymium, eight cents goes in here for the long-term storage of thorium. How hard is it to store thorium? It's an alpha emitter. John's gonna to talk to you more about that. But there are sovereign entities and there are sovereign wealth funds that are very, very interested in having a, an international platform to develop uh, industrial products, medical products, and mostly energy from thorium. And John can talk to you about that. I'm gonna finish up on this. What happens if, when we do this? When we do this, not if we do it, because if we don't do this, we stay on that course we're on, and it, really, we're in trouble. If we do this, and we're now the new center of the world for this, <clears throat> you're gonna have universities hooking up to this, you're gonna have uh, DOD, ARPA, DARPA, you're gonna have corporations move their research labs really close to this thing. You're gonna have your fabricators. You're gonna have people like uh, Mark, who now have a place to go. Mark's company could say, hey, we don't have enough capital to be an owner of the cooperative, but we wanna sit right out here, and we wanna fabricate. That's okay. We're having actually uh, started uh, uh, reaching out to companies that have IP. And, and showing the companies with the last bit of non-Chinese IP, the advantages of coming into this and being able to protect their IP because China has gone to the world courts and challenged their IP. Think about that. And that I, I, that's what's gonna keep happening. So this is a really, really powerful thing. And so I, I'm gonna stop here, a couple of questions, and we're gonna be available for all the questions you could imagine, but is there any, Technical question anybody has? Not technical, but this is it going to take some initial investment on the part of the government? No. Our government, unfortunately, let me tell you a sad story. <laughs> sad story. <laughs> Stop right there. The Japanese government has invested over a billion and a half dollars trying to solve the problem. The EU has a budget of $1.5 billion to solve the problem. Russia publicly announced they were going to spend over a billion dollars to solve the problem. You know how much the United States has spent to solve this problem? Collectively, $150 million, the majority of it for looking for alternatives. Those sneaky elements we haven't found yet. This is the problem. We haven't even taken this serious. And our own GAO has classified this as a bedrock national security issue. But it does require a federal funding. No federal funding. But other governments, like the Japanese government, have said they would put money into this. They would walk us around to their industries and tell their industries, you need to be part of this. So how does that play out then with you know, your last slide? You had kind of, we're going to have this in the United States, but all the investors are coming from these other countries, and you're, you're talking about more than mining. You're talking about building up a whole supply chain that's going to have a lot of IP. How does that remain? property of the United States in any way, shape, or form? It's not property. The, the owners, everybody who invests in this owns it. Right, so so where's the U.S. stake in it? The U.S. stake in it? Yeah. Well, we have a national security issue that gets solved. It's located we, in the U.S. We have a domestic security issue that gets solved, and then by definition, <coughs> when they meet the needs of the tech industry, by definition, they will meet every need that the Defense Department has and the defense contractors have. Right. So I, I hear you say we need it. I know that. Um, but, yeah, is it just because we're, we're donating the land? or you, I, I don't, Oh, I this don't is so cool. Like okay, I, I'm sorry. So all we're going to do is the same thing we did when, when farmers were starving in the 18th century, uh, in the 1800s in the United States. They literally would all farm their crops during the same two or three months, They'd all race them to the river, and there would be so much of them that the market price wasn't zero. The market price was negative. They were starving to death. They were dying. Congress said, that, how can we fix this? 
We're going to let them work together. We're going to give them an antitrust exemption. We're going to give them a charter. So in the Rubio bill, it, it directs the Commerce Department to offer a charter. And that charter, it goes out to our international economic partners, our, our allied partners, and invites them in. And the reason we're the best host for this is because we have a good, I mean, despite Ned's concern, we still have a pretty healthy mining economy, and it is kicking off enough what is currently thrown away, recoverable rare earths, that we can fuel this thing and you could never interrupt the input flow. Europe can't do that. They don't have enough mining. Uh, Brazil. Can I, can I summarize what you're saying? Yes. Okay, so first of all, this all came about because of thorium had all these regulations. The U.S. government put all these regulations on all these other guys. Is that right? That's correct. And if thorium hadn't been if unduly just, regulated, if they just missed it, then we'd been okay. We would have. We would still have uh, metal China. making in the United yeah. States, and China would not. Okay, have so now what you're technology. doing is you're putting together. You can call it a co-op. I would call it a <clears throat> a co-op um, across the world. Of course, across the world, and you're putting together, now don't quote me, <laughs> a <No>. mini China. <laughs> I'm, okay, I had this awesome meeting with the people that run the Steel Workers Union, and they said to me, has anybody done this before? And they, they were very worried. I mean, they're seeing their bread and their butter. They're getting hit, hit with the empty sack that the, the bread came in. I mean, they're really getting clobbered. They, they're worried about this. They were the first people to ever file a WTO complaint against China. And the, the legal person there at the desk said to me, has anybody ever tried this before? I said no, but it'll be the first one, and then they'll follow, because it's the only way. It's us against them, quite frankly. And if every one of us work together, they've but got you, 75 against 25. But you, we, we, we've done co-ops, very big co-ops, to save the integrated Semitech industry, yeah. So, I mean, so we've done very similar co-ops before. Semitech, we were losing the integrated circuit industry in the 80s. It was all going offshore, and we realized what a critical national security issue that was. And so Semitech, which is an absolute model for what we're trying to do, uh, was set up and it's been incredibly successful for almost 40 years, 35 plus years. Yeah. Isn't the bottom line that there's absolutely no way to make good on the promise of bringing back manufacturing here. I mean, you think China shut this down? I mean, we want jobs. Like, the only way to do that is if we can actually get a hold of the product. It's, it's even worse than that, because here we are with our bucket of promise, but it's got a huge hole at the bottom, because we had this discussion with, our, with folks from the National Lab. We said, you guys are out there innovating and doing material science work in rare earths but you're actually subsidizing China's economy because when they get deployed at the commercial level, they leave our shore. You're subsidizing their economy. So if we can't fix this, it only gets worse. And, and at some point, we are so far out of the IP R&D game that we just become their resource supplier. And that's not an enviable position. How long in between if the president signs it to a magnet coming out? So to, to actually make a magnet, uh, best case, probably three years. But we would be producing concentrates uh, within six months, oxides probably within 12 months, and then we could probably pr be producing metals in the 18 to 24 month range. But then when you actually get to the chemistry of the magnets, we're going to have to uh, work out some deals with people who have the IP. But three years, we could probably do it better. I mean, you know, Ad Admiral Rickover built the nuclear reactor for a submarine in 18 months. Quite frankly, if you guys gave this thing the juice that needed, and I'm not talking about money, I'm just talking about getting behind it, and you gave us the clout, not us, we wouldn't run it, if you gave this thing the clout to go around the world and tap our NATO partners and say, it's a national security risk for NATO, go to our economic partners through commerce and say to Toshiba Hitachi, and all of these other multinationals, we've got the answer and we expect you to respond. If you gave this thing the cloud it needed to solve this problem, it's faster. 
I don't know if it's any faster that you throw money at us, but I think it's faster when the government shows it's committed to solving a problem. I'm telling you, the whole world has been sitting on the edge of their seat so long that their legs have fallen asleep. They're waiting for the United States to solve this problem. Because so, no one else can. So I want to summarize it again. <coughs> so I, I need him up here. So basically, don't, don't interrupt me. I'll lose my train of thought. I'm an old guy. So basically, uh, you're, you have, we're in, we're in America. We're in America. So we have lots of land. We got lots of land. So we got lots of minerals out there. So we, we find the minerals and we scoop them up and then we can't use them. So this is to make it so that we use the materials right here so we, we're completely integrated from, from finding the materials to generating the, the final product. That's exactly what's going on. And if you pass Murkowski's bill or anybody else's bill, all they get us to is up to this line. And this line right here is we're making oxides and we're shipping them to China because we don't have the next parts up. This is the next part. So I have a really kill, killer question for you. And everybody in the room that has a business is going to ask you this question. So if people have a business are going to ask this question, anybody, any company you're going to talk to is going to ask you the same question. So I hope you got the answer. How long is it going to take you before you start making money? Well, this is the beauty of a cooperative. It makes money no matter what because it sells those finished products to its owners at cost. And that's a big, scary commitment for the off-takers, right? But the off-takers know that the resources coming in are very inexpensive and they're way better than what comes out of China. This thing will be built with the most advanced uh, uh, processing, metallurgical processing uh, 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 technology there is. We believe it can compete with China. Are you gonna be an advisor on this? Because it sounds like you, you know all the answers, but not many people know all the answers. This question is how long for metals? Okay, what I... What no, his, his question was profits. And, and the, the, the so answer to it is they automatically two make... Two years. No, they're profits. Three years. For, for profits year. or for metals? For metals... Sir, there are no profits. It's a co-op. So there's no such okay, thing as okay. profits. It's, there's no retained earnings. Okay, at the, by law, at the end of the year, you have to they're distribute buy, all left they're over. Gonna buy, they're going to spend money to put together the factory. Right. That's raw money. Right. Okay, so... But they get them at cost and they... Just a minute, just a minute. Let's say they, they spend a billion dollars for the factory. How long before the, the people that put up that billion dollars will get their billion dollars back in raw materials? I know they're getting it at cost, but then they have to sell it, and if they sell it at cost, then they don't have any interest. The factory will be productive within three years. Yeah, and within three years, it's producing material. They're buying the material, and I, I would say the that it, all of these companies are gonna put in a relatively small amount and they're all going to get out a large amount, which is to protect their IP. The most important thing for these companies who have real technology is protecting their IP. By the way, the governments, not our government, unfortunately, but these other governments are interested in putting in money to help lower the cost for their industries to succeed. It's not about a break-even analysis for them. They're essentially buying their own supply chain. And if they said, hey, you know, this thing looks interesting, but what if the magnets cost twice as much, right? What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to own enough of the offtake that it covers 40% of my need, and I'll buy the balance from China. That's okay. They'll just buy the balance from China to put in current technology that's on, on the shelf. But they'll have this portion they put in to the iPhone 27, okay, and they protect it. So, so it's not about returns. It's like saying, I have to build a factory floor over there to get something from this condition to this condition. And when it goes out to the end of the line and gets bought on a shelf, I measure my profits there. That's a contributed cost. That's all it is. But that contributed cost that will be the best money they ever spend unless they essentially want to start just, you know, uh, inviting China in to their R&D facility and just giving them a free run of the place. This is about protection. Is there a potential to take over out of our, I don't want to say hostile foreign actors such as China and Russia from participating in, say, so, co uh, What if we put spies in there? <laughs> no, 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 look, the way we wrote the language is a copy of Semtech, and the way that happens is 
that, that the, the charter and the bylaws will be written, and they will be written so it's clearly in the interest of, uh, of U.S. and aligned partners. And I don't think you want to legally say China can't join this, but do you really think anybody who just had their lunch handed to them for the last 15 years is going to let them in? Because it's a co-op. They don't have to let everybody in. And by the way, anybody who wants in has to get through CFIUS. And I wouldn't want to put it in language, but I would encourage CFIUS to say, hey guys, <coughs> never going to happen. I mean, we have to be careful about how we project uh, our willingness to play fair. But at the end of the day, that's what something like CFIUS is for. Is that a good answer? Look, I, 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 maybe one more question. I think John should handle uh, any issues related to uh, what's going to happen with the thorium and why we need all the regs. I support the uh, Defense Department's Industrial Policy Office, and um, so this is clearly a big issue. It sounds like the, a, a big message from you is that purchase commitments uh, through the Defense Production Act Title III program are really nibbling on the edge. So problem and while there might be some defense direct benefits it's not the strategic solution in, in any way shape or form. There, I lied to everybody there's two tools in our toolbox for market failure. One is subsidies, one is guaranteed purchases and what that does over time is it distorts things so bad that these guys over here who are now selling six thousand dollar tiny little penny sized magnets to the Defense Department that used to cost six bucks, they're selling for 6000 Do you think they'd ever want this to come into existence? So you go down that road, you're gonna create anomalies and they're gonna be really bad. You can never anticipate what subsidies or other things are gonna do and the distortions they're gonna create. If you go down that road, you're probably gonna cut this off. This will not be a road for you anymore. Um, but do they have a place? No. In, in the near term. In the near term, I can I will have a private discussion with you right outside that door for how that near term problem gets solved, and that can't be a public discussion. Right. But in the near term, the second you promise somebody that they're going to now be making three hundred percent on very little, you know, these things, right. you're going to have a political opponent that will never go away. Yeah. Um, there are there's a better solution in the near term. Because in the long term, the better this thing works and the more democratic it is for its owners, the more powerful this thing's gonna be. Imagine if you're a tech company and you're sitting outside this and they all get it at cost and you're paying market. Imagine these guys have automatic better access to the heavy rail earth that are coming at three times the rate they come out of China. They can now develop new technology that can't wasn't commercial before. You're sitting out here, you're never gonna see that material. Just imagine sitting out here knowing that these guys have an uninterruptible flow and, and you don't. You're gonna to wanna to be in. As soon as this thing gets two or three big players in it, everyone's gonna be scared to death to be out of it is if they believe it's going to be fair and liberal and democratic for the owners. If there's somebody over here making $6,000 magnets that should cost six bucks, and causing distortions and politically lobbying to hurt this thing and blocking it from doing things that it should be doing, you're just going to create an ugly animal, right? It's going to have too many heads. We'll never cut them all off. So I'd love to talk to you about this thing in just a few minutes. Um, I, I want John, I, I, you uh, guys should Jim, I'll, uh, we'll pick that up in the second. The you. second one. Okay, then I'll take one more question. Well, I'll take a hundred more questions. <laughs> it's my favorite topic in the world. Hi, my name is Sigia Easter from Jomek. Yes. And so uh, uh, I wonder, uh, do you have any idea uh, what's that? to connect your uh, new cooperative ideas with uh, other, uh, other potential, potential US producers, such as Australia, Canada, and Brazil? Because, as you may know, Jomek uh, has invested in Australia mining projects. Yes, yeah, so I have a, I've had a relationship with John Beck for some okay, time, yes. and I've had a much better, a much more formal relationship with AIST and Tashish Takagi and uh, his predecessor. Uh, we spent a lot of time on this. Our goal 
is to create an uninterruptible flow of material. Our goal is to, we've had discussions. We have a letter from AIST saying they're interested in this. They will participate. I've had discussions with the two, uh, the two last heads of the EU's uh, Commission on Rare Earths. They are very interested in this because they're spending 99.9% .9 of their rare earth solution money on recycling and the recycling products can't meet anything at market and they tend to be under spec and they're realizing it's, it's an unsustainable path until you get virgin material and so we can solve their problem. We can solve Japan's problem. Japan, the country could own this, every single big tech company in Japan could own a, a percentage of it and guarantee uninterruptible flow in perpetuity. So, and that's our goal. Our goal is we have to have a multinational platform. It's three to one. They have 75% and if every one of us works together, all we can get to is 25. But if we get to 25 and the cooperative owners agree that they should do their own R&D and they apply 5% of their funds to internal R&D, maybe we can get back on that roadmap to leading. So yes, Japan is a, a very, very, important potential for partner for us. Uh, this is Andrew signing that uh, so Austria has already uh, produced their own gas and so I understand that can such as for example Canada and Brazil has a potential of gas deposit. So uh, uh, there is a possibility to make a uh, global supply chain in free uh, free market countries. So right. uh, can this uh, can your idea be connected such with such as global uh, free trade system. Absolutely. So, so this thing will take material from anybody who is willing to sell them material that meets their needs at their price. Remember, they're going to get most of their material from stuff that's being thrown away that's really, really good. But Mountain Pass can come here and, and, and use this facility and, and, and we'll buy it if they have what we want. What's incredible is in the legislation, we allow for tolling. So let's say Mountain Pass or Bear Lake or any other rare earth mine says, it's our rare earths, but we want you to make us metals and give them back to us. In the, in the, the Rubio legislation, it allows for tolling. So they would just essentially pay a small fee above the cooperative's cost and they would get back in metal, what they gave us. This thing is designed for everyone. This thing's designed to be fair. Because if we're not fair, nobody's gonna play with us. Okay, thank you. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.